सब हो गया गेट रेडी वन Good morning, one and all present here. First of all, a uh, happy Wildlife Protection Day to all of you. Uh, I am Kakuli, and I welcome you all to the webinar on understanding basics of wildlife protection laws in India, organized by the Law Dictat. So, Law Dictat is an AI-driven project for the legal industry by the Alpha AI, an AI research company that aims to bridge gap between how law and technology interact with each other. so before starting the event or telling you about anything related to the event i would like to tell you all the things that law dictated has has to offer you so starting with the blogging so law dictated provides you the platform to become the writer that you want to and write blogs on the various legal topics ai related topics that you are interested in and if we really like that it it is your chance to promote your writing on a platform we also provide interns to the lawyers and the various organization that are looking for the potential good intern who can work for them and have a good skills and knowledge of the law thirdly uh, advocates can also take advantage of the law dictat they have a great reach to the clients we allow advocates to log in on our website and have their access to the potential clients other than this the lawyers uh, not only lawyers but clients people who are in search of the who are in need of the lawyers can also go on our website and get an access to the lawyers other than this students have the chance for the courses law dictate provides numerous courses on various topics related to the laws and various topics related to law and technology so yeah we have various courses i hope you can get access to it other than this ai provides special sessions on AI, uh, sorry law dictate provides special sessions on ai we have exclusive in house member discussion on ai related topic hot topics that has been trending in the environment on related to computers techs ai other than this student spotlight student spotlight is basically a platform where the intern of the month or the student of the month who is working really very hard and working good will get a chance to be present or uh, to be on the uh, website of the uh, law dict that as the student of the month other than this not only this we are since of with all these benefits all the advocates and the students get a chance to have their brand visibility lawyers who have experience in specific law can get a chance to promote themselves on our website students can also get a chance to promote themselves on our website because since if they are working with us and we really like their work the blogs will be there the spotlight uh, student spotlight will help you to get uh, to have their reach other than this we have a 24/7 availability of the lawyers not the lawyers that we are outsourcing it's a in house panel if you have any doubt any query related to law you can just go on our website log in there and post your query we will resolve we will try to resolve you query resolve your query as soon as possible with the help of the lawyers we have so law dictate is basically uh, a part of alpha ai alpha ai is a broad umbrella that helps that attempts to include all aspects of the legal profession we are we are not only assisting individuals or entrepreneurs we are also assisting startups corporations other organizations as well so this is all about the law dictate so starting further we have as uh, for the for today's web webinar we have our respected speaker uh with us who will discuss the fundamentals of the wildlife protection act its relevance concerning increasing threats to the environment as well as the important topics that can affect nature in the long run it is a very important that we take the discussion on this topic because since we have seen with the increasing of the population globalization or also the global warming the environment has been affected badly from a small species to a big to a big giant animal or anything they are being affected the numbers are reducing day by day and everything so it is very important that we take a chance and discuss about them today we have mehak dudeja with us who who holds a master degree in environment and natural resources law from terry school of advanced studies she has worked with ldf and is currently engaged as a program associate with the apec she is very much concerned about 
the environment as much as we are and we would really like to uh, we would really love to, li to listen to her uh, i welcome you mahak to the webinar we are glad to have you here uh, over to you hi hi everyone uh, can you hear me am i audible yeah you are audible okay just give me a second uh, my internet is lagging i'll just switch on my video Hi, I'm sorry. So thanks, uh, Kakuli, and hi, Akash. Uh, thanks for having me today. And uh, yeah, I'd like to begin with the understanding of what uh, wildlife laws are, how India is progressing, and what are we doing to protect wildlife and in, uh, Indian legal regime. So I'll begin. I'll just share my screen. I have this PPT prepared for everyone. Yeah, hi. So I hope this is uh, visible to everybody. So today's topic is understanding the basics of wildlife protection laws in India. Uh, before we uh, dig deeper into understanding uh, what the wildlife protection in India, how the wildlife protection in India is, let us just understand what is wildlife. So according to the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, wildlife includes any animal, bees, butterflies, or any crustacea, fish, moths, like it's mentioned here, and any aquatic or land vegetation, which forms a part of any habitat. So this is how our Wildlife Protection Act is defining the wildlife. Moving further, okay, so we see that the foundation of Wildlife Conservation Act is basically understood, uh, it, it basically uh, is understood through Indian constitution. So uh, when we go and understand and see how Indian constitution has addressed the subject, uh, we see here that the 42nd amendment to Indian constitution, you know, it is a progressive step towards laying the groundwork for protecting animal, uh, animal and wild, wildlife in India. So over here, Uh, hi, sorry, my internet went off. Uh, um, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. Just give me a second. There are some internet issues. Yeah. So as I was talking about the definition of wildlife, uh, we see that the wildlife is defined under Wildlife Protection Act of India 1972. However, uh, there are certain things that need to be understood uh, before we go on and understand how Wildlife Protection Act came up with this definition. As of now, we see that Indian constitution has taken a progressive step towards laying down the groundwork for animal protection in India. So if we look, so if we look into the 42nd amendment, which came in 1976, we see that it introduced this article 48A. So which basically imposes an obligation on the state to protect and improve the environment, including wildlife. 
So if we read Article 48A, we see that, uh, so it mentions protection and improvement of environment and safeguarding of forest and wildlife. The state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. So here it is uh, basically 42nd Amendment of uh, 42nd Amendment of Constitution of India has introduced Article 51A, which is imposing a fundamental duty on every citizen to protect wildlife and to have a compassion for living creatures. So this is the foundation uh, as how we perceive in today's world. However, if we talk about the evolution of wildlife protection regime in India, we see that Indian Forest Act, uh, which came in 1927, was one of the initial acts which talked about wildlife. And because of this act only, today we see that Wildlife Protection Act has uh, included the definition of wildlife. So when we go back and understand what Indian Forest Act says, here uh, we, see, we see that Indian Forest Act talked about few things, for example, forest produce. So the definition of forest produce included animals within its ambit. So th that is where I'm so sorry for these internet interruptions. So if we talk about Indian Forest Act, we see that this concept, which talked about the forest produce, it actually talk, it actually introduced the term wildlife. And this is where from Wildlife Protection Act had picked up and it introduced the definition of wildlife in India. Now, we, if we talk about the Forest Conservation Act, we see that it forms the part of the concurrent list and it goes back to the 42nd Amendment, which we just saw in the previous slide. Moving further. So as I was talking about the evolution of wildlife protection regime in India, we see that first Indian Forest Act of 1865 came into the picture. Then we see that Madras Wildlife Elephant Preservation Act was introduced. For, uh, it was followed by Elephant Preservation Act 1879. Then Indian Forest Act 1927 came in. Then Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Then Forest Conservation Act and then Environment Protection Act in 1986. Now here, uh, as I was talking about the evolution of the definition of wildlife. So if you see, none of these acts define wildlife per se, only Wildlife Protection Act has included its definition. But before that definition came into play, these four acts played a major role. So like I said, Indian Forest Act talked about forest produce, which introduced the concept of wildlife. And then El similarly, Elephant Preservation Act was introduced, which particularly, particularly talked about protecting elephants in India and so on and so forth. Now, when we see the governance architecture in India, okay, so first thing that we come across is that you know, we what we observe is that there is an overlapping uh, between wildlife protection regime and forest regime. So how our governance architecture flows is, so historically, uh, the Indian Board for Wildlife stated that the protection of wildlife has to be the responsibility of forest departments. The fact that the historical legislations were silent on the subject of wildlife protection, the recommendation of the board was to devise a uniform legislation for wildlife protection through and of which the Wildlife Protection Act was the result. Now, secondly, the board also recommended setting up of wildlife state boards and Wildlife Institute of India was also formed. So the forest officers and rangers that we hear today, they are trained for wildlife related matters too. So, the formation of national parks, sanctuaries and reserves were a result of this comprehensive legislation itself and the wildlife wings were also incorporated in almost all the forest departments. Now here, as I go and reading these points and uh, like I'm talking about forest departments and then wildlife, we've already seen that there is an overlap and we, and we also saw that Indian Forest Act played a major role in, in introducing uh, what wildlife was and how do we go on protecting it. And like I stated further, the definition of forest produce, this included the definition of wildlife. And you can, uh, 
see section 4 of indian forest act where it says that wild wild animals and skins tusks horns bones silk etc they are all part of produce of animals now moving on uh, so if we dig deeper into the legislations that deal with wildlife conservation in india so the first one uh, that needs to be looked into is wildlife protection act of 1972 so it is an important legislation in India. Uh, these are the salient features. So this talks about prohibit prohibition of hunting. Then it talks about protection and management of wildlife habitats. Then it talks about establishment of protected areas, regulation, regulation and control of trade and parts and products derived from wildlife and management of zoos. Now, uh, if we understand and if we analyze all these salient features that are uh, mentioned in wildlife protection act you know this part where it talks about trade wildlife trade here you know a contradiction can be uh, you know spotted because wildlife protection act does not define uh, the concept of wildlife trade as such so it does give us a mechanism of uh, provision which says that okay there should not be any illegal trading uh, in wildlife but it is not defining illegal wildlife anywhere so here there is one contradiction and although it's a strong legislation but in execution it is uh, like it has certain drawbacks and, and then uh, if we go and talk about protection and management of wildlife habitats we see that national parks and tiger reserves are by law more strictly protected. So they virtually allow no human activity in uh, these areas, except, you know, grazing and private ten tenural uh, rights are also disallowed in national parks, but they can be allowed in sanctuaries at the discretion of chief wildlife warden. Also, the amended Wildlife Protection Act does not allow for any commercial exploitation of forest produce in both national parks as well as wildlife sanctuaries. And local communities can collect forest produce only for their bona fide needs. So this is how our Wildlife Protection Act has uh, evolved the protection regime. Second, uh, no wild mammal, bird, amphibian, reptile, fish, insects or any etc they can be hunted or either you know within or outside protected areas only on conviction the penalty for hunting is imprisonment for a period ranging from a minimum of three to maximum of seven years with fines not less less than ten thousand rupees so this is another point where you know we can reflect upon the penalty regime as propounded by wildlife protection in India. So 10,000 rupees in today's world is nothing. So if you spot anyone who is, you know, who goes for hunting and the fine is just 10,000 rupees, I don't think that this is a very effective penalty regime that we are following in today's world as well. Third, uh, when we talk about community reserves and conservation reserves, so these are the, these are new two categories. Uh, which were introduced. So these two categories provide a greater role for local communities to, you know, come into picture. So all the local communities, stakeholders and civil societies, they have the opportunity to protect as many areas of conservational value as they can. So you know how uh, the local communities work, right? So local communities, while they are also protecting the habitat, the forest area, in a way, they are also protecting the wildlife regime. Then, uh, Wildlife Crime Control Bureau was constituted in 2006 and, you know, it uh, monitors and controls the illegal trade in wildlife products. And then WLPA also provides for investigation and prosecution of offences in court of law by authorized officers of the Forest Department and police officers. So these are more or less the important features about Wildlife Protection Act. Moving further, uh, when we talk about Indian Forest Act of 1927. Okay, so here we see that the main objective of the Indian Forest Act was to secure the exclusive state controls over forest to meet the demand for timber. You know, if you go on and uh, read the preamble of this act, you'll notice the word timber in the preamble itself and it talks about how we should conserve and protect timber. So it was, uh, this act came in colonial time, right? So the timber was of utmost importance, but while 
the protection regime was evolving around protecting the forest area for only protecting timber and now the wildlife also forms a part of the forest uh, area or habitat so indirectly we were conserving and protecting the wildlife uh, in uh, in india also so most of these untitled lands had traditionally belonged to the forest dwelling communities so the act defined state ownership regulated its use and appropriated the power to substitute or extinguish customary rights and now the act facilitates three category of forests namely reserve forest wilderness forest protected forest over here when we see when we you know in this previous slide i talked about national parks tiger reserves and protected areas so certain types of activities that are allowed in this area and certain type of activities that are totally restricted so this is where this idea you know comes from moving on uh, we see that reserve forests are the most protected within these categories no rights can be acquired in reserve forests except by succession or under a grant or a contract with government so felling of trees grazing cattle removing forest products or fishing or hunting they are you know all punishable with a fine or imprisonment although the indian forest act is a federal act so many states have enacted similar forest act but with some modifications uh moving on forest conservation act of 1980 we see that the aim of the forest is to preserve the forest ecosystem of india by fulfilling the following objectives so protecting the forest along with its flora and fauna and other diverse ecological components while preserving the integrity and territory of the forest so you know in previous slides how i mentioned that forest regime and wildlife regime is overlapping so in a way if you are protecting the habitat you are protecting the wildlife so forest conservation act also highlights this fact that you know while you are protecting flora and fauna this is where the wildlife conservation also comes into picture then again another uh, salient feature of, about this act is that you know uh, there should not be any loss in the forest biodiversity hence in indirect way you are protecting the wildlife regime so it prevents forest lands being converted into agriculture grazing or for any other commercial purposes and intention moving further forest conservation act of 1980 you know it comes with these following features where the act restricts the state government and other authorities to take decisions first without you know taking permission from the central government so this point point basically reflects that the act is in a way centralized it's a strong reg legislation but there are certain activities which ultimately you know for which you have to seek approval from the central government so like it, so like i mentioned in the previous slides also that Indian Forest Act is a federal act you know and how other states have also enacted almost the similar act but there are certain modification same goes here with this concept forest conservation now forest conservation act you know it gives complete authority to central government to carry out the objectives of this act the act levies penalties in case of violations of the provisions of fca the forest conservation act will have an advisory committee which will help the central government with regard to forest conservation so these are the basic features which gives you an understanding of how these acts are basically devised to protect wildlife in our country so this is an important judgment that i that i am sure most of us have come across especially the law students so this judgment you know this uh, imposed a complete ban on release of forest land for non forestry activities without the prior approval of the federal government so if you've heard about this concept of environmental clearance you know when you have to set up any industry so setting up of an industry is a non forestry activity right so any industry you know uh, which is disrupting any wildlife corridor for instance this is where uh, this legislation comes into play where you are actually a uh, restricting or you know giving in a way positive if we have to reframe it positively we say that it authorizes the government to only give clearances to such industry or such non forestry activities which are not harmful for our environment hence wildlife in this scenario so you must have seen that there are hardly any industries set up in areas where there is 
uh, you know, heavy vegetation or wildlife corridors. So no such environmental clearance is given there. And this is basically uh, flowing from this concept of forest conservation, which is highlighted in this le uh, legislation, this act. Moving further, the Environment Protection Act of 1986. Now, here I've mentioned that, you know, national environmental policy, it defines that environment comprises of all entities, natural or man-made, external to oneself. And, you know, when I say all entities, it includes everything, flora, fauna and everything. So it is not specifically identifying any component, but it is giving more of a liberal interpretation when it comes to saving environment. So when you say that you have to save environment, you say you have to save the habitat, you have to save forest. And then, you know, flowing from that idea, we talk about wildlife protection regime, basically, which is the essence of this presentation that protection of wildlife regime in India is, you know, flowing from protection of forests in our country or protection of environment. So that is how that is how this idea was devised. So it does not provide for protecting wildlife in specific, but as the preamble states, it has to protect the environment, which would include forests also and wildlife as well. So in a way, it's, it is an umbrella re legislation. And here, just to give you a uh, give you an understanding of the agenda or aim of EPA, it is you know somewhere focused upon establishing a coordination between central and state relations when it comes to water and air acts now how now when i was talking about environmental clearances right so these two concepts are related so environment protection act is in a way focused on this aspect and you know this is and from this aspect the protection regime the wildlife protection regime that i'm talking about is flowing Third point, when it, uh, the third point mentions saving environment and saving wildlife. Like I talked about in the previous slide, EPA authorizes the government to protect and improve the environmental floor, uh, clarity and etc. But it prohibits or restricts the setting or operation of any industrial facility on environmental grounds. For which I just gave you an example of setting up of any industry in forest area or any restricted area or area which has uh, a wildlife corridors. So the concept of environmental clearance flows from this concept and then uh, it has the implication where it mentions about restricting any uh, wildlife to being harmed in any manner whatsoever by industrial activities. Moving further. Biological Diversity Act of 2002. So India is party to United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. So the provisions of Biological Diversity Act are in addition to and not in derogation of the provisions of any other law. This is how we read. The salient features of this act are as follows. So if you just uh, skim through these features, you will see that conservation and sustainability of biological diversity is important. Then uh, you see that regulation, sorry. So you see that regulation of access to biological resources of this country is important. And then, you know, securing sharing of benefits with local people and protection and rehabilitation of threatened species. So these are basically the uh, salient features of this act. But how this act is actually empowering uh, Indian legislations or Indian wildlife protection regime to protect wildlife in its true sense. So in order to carry out the provisions of the act, the National Biodiversity Authority was set up under the Ministry of Environment and Forest by in 2003. So it is a statutory body and it is an autonomous body and it is headquartered in Chennai. So state biodiversity boards were also created in 29 states along with biological management committees for each local body. Under this act, the central government in consultation with NBA shall notify threatened species, prohibit or regulate their collection, rehabilitation and conservation. So this authority is of paramount, you know, it, it is uh, it is of paramount importance. So here if we see that uh, it is actually notifying the threatened species, it is prohibiting or regulating their collection. Here we are talking about wildlife trade also. 
so this body is actually playing its role uh, i'd say that i'd like to highlight this authority's role in uh, uh enhancing the wildlife protection regime in india so you know here if we see that designated institutions uh are, as repositories for different categories of bio biological resources they were formed and the functions of nba were also important like in monitoring and prevention of actions like it said were prohibited in this act then providing advice to government on how best to conserve biodiversity then preparing a report on how government can select bio biological heritage sites and then making concrete steps towards preventing the grant of intellectual property rights so when we talk about intellectual property rights and wildlife the idea is that uh, the biological resources that are uh, being locally used or you know which are alien to traditional knowledge so over here you know uh, the interplay of wildlife protection and ipr comes into picture so we'll not go into details of uh, this very aspect if you have any questions i'll be more than happy to write an email to you or give you a detailed answer on how this provision is uh, impacting the whole regime moving further the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 so the legislative intent of this act was to prevent the infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering on animals the animal welfare board of india was established in 1962 under section 4 of the act so the act provides for punishment for causing unnecessary cruelty and suffering to animals and it defines animals in different forms of animals also so it discusses different forms of cruelty exceptions and killing of a suffering of an animal in case any cruelty has been committed it also provides the guidelines relating to experimentation on animals for scientific purposes the act enshrines the provisions relating to exhibition of the performing animals and offenses committed against such animals and the act provides for limitation period of 3 months beyond which no prosecution shall lie for any offenses under this act so you know when we read this legislation it comes off as more promising than how we saw the previous legislations right here it is talk here it is defining animals and forms of animals it is talking about cruelty then it's talking about <coughs> certain exceptions it is laying down guidelines so in a way you see that it is talking about components of all the legislation which we've just discussed in previous slides and an additional leave provided by this act is under section 28 and <clears throat> it says that nothing in this act shall render it an offense to kill an animal in a manner required by the religion of any community so it is a very important provision or and then uh, moving further treating any animal cruelty is punishable with a fine of 10 rupees again it's a drawback but okay so other legislation had covered this point but still the penalty system in india uh, when it comes to imposing fines is not very strong uh okay so yeah moving further like i was mentioning so there are certain reflections from all the legislations that we just went through so like as like i was saying that the penalty system is not very effective you see that imprisonment is what few months and imposition of fine is basically ranging from rupees 10 to rupees 10000 rupees 10000 in today's world you know it's not too much if you're killing an animal then 10000 is won't suffice the justice that you would want to uh, see so penalty system is one thing which can be worked upon secondly the definition of wildlife trade like i was saying it is not included in the act so illegal wildlife trade is still a challenge uh when it comes to protecting wildlife in our country and this aspect in protection of wildlife regime needs urgent attention it needs to be uh folk paid special heed upon it needs to be it it needs to be understood in a manner that first the definition of illegal wildlife trading should be clear it should be laid down under wlpa and second illegal wildlife trade a uh, trade penalty system should also be strengthened along with other penalty systems that we've just seen and like we've seen that the legal framework for protection of wildlife in india is strong 
but it is in a way centralized it is fine there is not much of a problem here but not getting into too much details of political will uh this is where the bureaucracy can also you know come in so when you see the forest uh when you see forest departments or forest act or if you just see the 2019 draft of uh forest act which attempted to amend the indian forest legislation you will see that the whole system is centralized in a manner where you know bureaucratic will is being reflected or it is being imposed and this aspect has the ability to in a way uh, affect the wildlife protection regime in india again it's a topic which uh, demands detailed discussion and uh, i'll be more than happy to write to you in case you need uh, any more discussion on this point but these majorly are three reflections which need to be placed special heed upon going back certain additions that i want to make in my presentation is uh, where we talked about the overlapping of the in uh, forest regime and wildlife regime one second here you know so the there has been debate where uh, a lot of uh, academicians have you know advocated that if we should have one comprehensive regime, one comprehensive legislation for protecting both wildlife and forest, or we should have different legislation to protect the both. Now, during this whole presentation, you saw that there were a lot of overlaps. In forest protection regime, you will see wildlife coming into picture. In forest protection regime, you will see that, okay, forest producers talking about wildlife. So the debate is if we should have one legislation for both, or if we should have two separate legislation because the problem is that inter coordination between the departments of both forest and wildlife protection is something that is in a way causing problem so when it comes to environmental clearances so you know there are two clearances one there is wildlife clearance also and another we, we've seen the environmental clearance so for wildlife clearance you will go to the uh respected boards that i just mentioned and then for ec there is a different procedure so there is a drawback or there's a loophole which can be spotted when it comes to understanding uh both the regimes and how we can actually go on protecting uh, such areas which include wildlife corridors so this overlapping this intercoordination is one drawback which is highlighted in our indian uh, legal system so this is one thing in addition to the reflections that I've just mentioned. Overall, uh, concluding my uh, presentation, I'd just like to mention, especially uh, today is very important day for wildlife protection in India. You know, uh, there are little acts uh, uh, that, you know, we see or witness in our day-to-day -day lives. You see any, uh, suppose a dog, crossing the street or passing by you see a person hitting the animal that is also a person hitting the dog that is also animal cruelty ranging from the smallest act to how we see hunting is still being practiced in indian uh, regime is something that needs to be again addressed and for this the laws need to be refined they need to be uh, they need to place a special focus upon the penalty system of india so that it is more effective, it is more stringent and actions follow accordingly. So this is it. This is all about my presentation on understanding the basics of wildlife protection laws in India. Uh, yeah, so if anyone has any questions. If anyone have any question they need to ask. I know I rushed through my presentation, uh, so if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Okay, uh, in the meanwhile, Mac, I have a question, uh, yeah. just a simple question. It's like uh, in 2021, December, a wildlife protection bill was passed. Yeah. Uh, in that bill, uh, the government commercialized the sale of the living elephants, uh, but uh, don't you think that this is the this is not this was not the idea behind the uh, act and it is a major drawback because the act was wildlife protection and we are just commercializing the sale of a living animal which is an indian heritage and it's a major loophole 
That is uh, very true. And yeah, like you mentioned that this wildlife protection bill was introduced in 2021. And uh, the, you know, if you go and read this bill, it specifically talk about sites. I I think you would know what sites is. Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species or Wild, Wild Fauna and Flora. So yeah, in a way, the bill is talking about protection, how, how we can protect the endangered species and rightly pointed out by you it says that okay uh the trade in wildlife animals such as elephants you know it is somewhere encouraging it yes it is a contradiction in this bill however uh you know if we go into understanding the nuances or the intricacies present in this bill we see that it is talking about obligations which the which we need to fulfill under sites so I'm not sure, I don't believe that uh, whatever you're saying will be executed properly. However, uh, if you want to have a detailed discussion on this bill, I can just go on and uh, talk about it. If there is any specific question. I was just, uh, you know, very much concerned about that point because I just, I randomly read that and I thought that this is, this is not what should be the, uh, you know, idea behind any law and this is the this is in total opposite of what law stands for so i thought i should discuss yeah so the law is not loudly uh saying that this should happen it is actually talking about uh, conservation reserves and it is giving importance to sites it definitely has its drawbacks but it is not it it all depends on how you're gonna implement the piece of legislation if it comes into play yeah yeah so it, it is yeah sorry now you can continue sorry yeah so you know it is talking about how we can just go on and control sanctuary so you you've heard about chief wildlife warden so you know it is specifically emphasizing upon how chief wildlife warden uh, can exercise its control and manage and maintain all the sanctuaries and how it is appointed by the state government and how it will play its role in uh, you know protecting the wildlife regime in india so there are definitely certain silent drawbacks, but uh, loudly any law or any bill cannot advocate for, uh, you know, trading or any such illegal trading per se. Okay, but I some somewhere I believe in India, they, the laws related to the protection of environment are more underrated as compared to any other laws. Like we have centuries, we have biodiversities and, you know, wildlife everywhere we are trying to protect but when it comes to you know <clears throat> preparing a law like you have mentioned the penalty for uh, like uh, doing the cruelty against the animal is rupees 50 i guess i, I don't remember the exact amount, but Correct. yeah but that i think that it is very much wrong when we are considering something a living like a human when it when it comes to human it's it's more of a very strict law but when it comes to animal it's more of a okay it is a law so what we can do so i guess the laws are very much underrated so what can be done to make these laws more applicable and uh you know legitimate in relation to the other laws <clears throat> exactly that's the whole point so the first thing that i mentioned was the penalty system i believe the penalty system should be improved so all these laws i mean you see that most of these laws were laid down in colonial times and rightly pointed out by you that the imposition of fine is one problem so i believe this is where uh you know there could be a government or policy intervention where we could redefine the penalty or the governance structure in india that can strengthen the wildlife protection that was the that was majorly the essence of my presentation two things mm -hmm. one uh how inter coordination between different departments is affecting the wildlife protection regime second the penalty system in, it, in itself is not very strong so this is where we need an intervention and correctly pointed out by you that wildlife protection in india is sort of underrated why and how it is underrated you know if we understand the evolution of this law like i mentioned in the beginning wildlife was not even talked about when we talked about forest acts or when we talked about protecting forests under in a uh, forest protection regimes ambit we introduced the concept of conserving wildlife and this is how basically the idea has been ingrained so Today, if you are looking for any intervention, 
first we need to introduce certain definitions like i mentioned specifically for illegal wildlife trading under wlpa second we need to strengthen the penalty system that's what i believe okay uh thank you so much uh, for clearing out my doubt and now i would like to uh, welcome akash and uh please akash over to yeah hi i hope i'm uh, audible yeah yeah, yeah. hi my hack i hope you're doing well yeah i'm doing great i'm sorry my internet is sort of fluctuating so i haven't turned on my video it just went off twice during the session so yeah no issues no issues i totally understand so firstly i would like to sincerely appreciate you for taking out a time from your busy schedule as no i know that it was your working day and i'm so sorry that we have disturbed you on your working day and no, you have provided us with such a valuable information like your session was so well structured the way you started and then you covered all the laws in short span of time you tried to cover each and everything so thank you for such a valuable session thanks akash i hope i was able to uh, communicate uh, clearly what wildlife protection regime is so yeah it is it is it was very good actually it was very good and even i came to know so many things because i am not obviously much aware about environmental laws so thank you for even making me aware mm, thank you so much for having me here for the session yeah you know we have some questions actually uh, one of when we have the registration form so there was one of the questions where someone wants to know that how they can start their career and mm -hmm. the environmental laws the places where they intern and the kind of ngos they can join if they want to pursue the career in environmental laws okay uh so for environmental laws or specifically for wildlife laws because specifically for wildlife wildlife laws there are different entities starting from the world conservation society so it does take into uh consideration the freshers and even if you have 0 to 1 year of experience you can still apply for the post of law officer with wcs then uh, if you want to intern i feel wwf is a great opportunity great platform where you can intern i have interned with wwf so you can specifically intern with its uh, cel which is center for environmental law cell for environmental law and uh, then there are yes different institutes like wildlife uh, institute of india so for wii you need to give a proper exam and then there is a proper interview and that is also an opportunity for all the freshers to you know just uh, go like come and be a part of uh, this whole wildlife protection you might say and yeah so these three institutions i believe uh, they have an easy you know entry for freshers because when i graduated i also applied at these institutions but my interest was uh, like i was more interested in litigation so that is where so that 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 was why i applied uh, at eldf so at eldf also i was dealing with forest and wildlife uh, regime and wildlife protection laws and yes eldf has different practice areas one of uh, those areas is forest and wildlife uh, regime and another organization which i feel is effective is life a uh, legal initiative uh, for forest and environment it is led by uh, mr ritvik datta so over there if you want to delve into research you can apply for a legal researcher position or if you want to go into litigation then yes they have different positions structured into associate lawyers and lawyers and all that so you can go there and apply and this is some personal question like how to find out like if someone is interested in environmental law can you suggest some books like so people can read out before starting the career uh okay certain books <laughs> okay so a uh, personal favorite is one book written by both wwf and eldf i can uh, share the link with you and probably uh, you can just circulate i okay. feel that that book gives a comprehensive idea in fact about how different states have reacted to wildlife protection regime so like i was mentioning that uh, this legislation is sort of centralized i did not get into details of how it is centralized but if you go and read that book you will see the centralized governance archi architecture and secondly how different states have reacted so this is sort of an advanced reading when you want to understand the law but uh, to 
start with basics i'd say just go to google scholar to read different articles read different research papers and try to understand the basic definitions for understanding the basic definitions or what an act is saying the first thing is that you read the preamble of that act everyone knows i mean you and i and i think other people who are law students they know that and flowing from there read the definitions and then go on and read different judgments so this is how you can start off and start building your foundation in understanding environmental laws because in india environmental law is one thing which is sort of uh, a combination of law and policy both and there is still some research going on and coming up with new laws there are certain uh, acts laws bills whatever they are still lying in drafts so go and research on these things and we'll give you a clearer idea <laughs> okay so i think so like if we get a chance like to ad adopt like obviously india tries uh, tries to have laws from other nations so if it comes to the environmental laws so mm -hmm. from which countries we can take laws like which country you think have better laws than others uh so environmental protect environment protection regime in most of the countries is way better than india uh i'm not sure of any specific country as of now maybe even i'll do some research and probably get back to you and uh, yeah but uh i think in india environment protection is sort of uh, compromised because of how it is more focused on its development capitalist activities whereas in developed countries if you go and read the environment protection laws especially us epa uh you will see that they are stable enough to focus on these aspects so i don't have a detailed understanding myself uh but uh, even i'd like to read and probably get back to you on how wildlife uh, protection laws are get like evolved in different countries even yesterday i was seeing one video where the person he is posting is and he is trying to uh, sort trees everywhere like by using the seed balls and i was very amazed to see that uh, seed balls are not available in india very easily or even seeds of certain plants which become trees so trees uh, seed of trees are not available so i didn't get you so you were uh, reading some article yeah, no i was reading i i was reading some article yeah. the person was also concerned about environmental laws and he was trying he was preparing for is so he was using seed balls so if anyone like today is a wildlife day so if anyone is concerned even about the environment so i can just recommend them to use seed balls to grow trees oh, yeah. around them yeah. yeah so yeah basically seed ball or seed bomb you're talking about right yeah yeah that's a very good idea actually and uh, i also believe that uh, yeah i mean it's a good idea <laughs> <laughs> anything like you you want me to talk about it anything in particular no no i think so like we already have or we already had your one hour so it was more than sufficient for us if they yeah. have some questions they can ask like students we have the questions on the youtube so if there are any questions so we i can just check and i will let you know in one minute mm, yeah definitely no i i think so your uh, webinar was very much sorted so they don't have any queries so i think it was a good sign it is a good sign i really hope they understood <laughs> yeah they do and we will be sharing if we come across any questions from our linkedin or from any uh, of our channels so we will just drop it to you okay sure not an issue thank you so much thank, thank you so much thank you so much it was a pleasure having you thank you thanks akash okay, okay. bye bye bye